Um, hi, uh, Jennifer Lee here. I'm going to be introducing our speaker today. Um, Wendy Larson is a professor emerita of East Asian Languages and Literature at the University of Oregon. She obtained her PhD in Oriental Language from the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, over her career, she's been she's become a specialist of modern and contemporary Chinese culture, and she's written many works, including Literary Authority and the Chinese Writer, Ambivalence and Autobiography, Women and Writing in Modern China, From A Q to Lei Feng, Freud and Revolutionary Spirit in 20th Century China, and Zhang Yimou, Globalization and the Subject of Culture. Um, Professor uh, Larson has also translated Wang Meng's modernist novel, Bolshevik Salute, and co-edited uh, two works, Gender in Motion, Divisions of Labor and Cultural Change in Late Imperial and Modern China, and Inside Out, Modernism and Postmodernism in Chinese Literary Culture. Dr. Larson's present research project analyzes optimism under socialism and capitalism with focus on 1950s China and the United States. Uh, Wendy has been a great friend to First Saturday PDX. Uh, she has given uh, several, excuse me, several presentations on a variety of different topics, including contemporary Chinese society, a view from films of Zhang Yimou. Also, she came to speak with us in 2018 on China in the pursuit of happiness. And also most recently in September, 2020, collecting under socialism, philately in 1950s China. And today, <laughs> Professor Larson will be discussing Yang Mo's Song of Youth and Frederick, Frederick Koner's Gidget, two iconic 1950s novels and their subsequent movies that became cultural phenomena in their respective countries. Um, Catherine mentioned that we had a bit of a power outage concern last night, so we were especially excited that we were able to um, have, uh, have uh, Wendy with us today. And we're looking forward to hearing about how the young female protagonists in these works defied gender expectations and fought inequality with optimism. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Larson. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, Wendy Larson, uh, Professor Emerita at the University of Oregon. And I will be speaking about two novels. Um, Girl uh, Gidget is one, and probably some of you have heard of Gidget. And Song of Youth is another, and probably some of you have heard of uh, Song of Youth as well. It's, it's rare to have people who have heard of both novels. So I'm going to share my screen now. So um, first I want to uh, contextualize my talk just a tiny bit because this actually is part of the uh, optimism under socialism and capitalism project that I've been working on for a long time and hope to be finished with soon. Um, I was struck uh, by the emphasis on promoting an optimistic attitude in the 1950s, especially in China and the United States, and start to look into uh, what made these radically different societies, one socialist and one capitalist, both valorize optimism. Um, this is a work in progress, of course, so I'm still not really to the end of where I need to be, but this is kind of a presentation as I go along. So I'm going to talk about these two uh, literary examples, and this will be a visually heavy talk. I'm going to cheat with film images because it's hard to discuss literature, and it's good sometimes to have something on the screen to anchor uh, what I'm talking about. So it may strike you that these two novels I've chosen are from very different realms. Uh, one is roughly in the category of literary fiction, that is Yang Mo's work, and the other is popular fiction, that's Gidget. And there's a reason for this. So uh, one of the questions I ask myself is, in the United States, were there any controls on literature as there were uh, in socialist China? And of course, there was constant debate and elite and some popular culture was historically censored through uh, national or state or municipal book bans and even book burnings. And one of the first books to be burned was The Meritorious Price of Our Redemption by fur trader William Pynchon, which had been published in London in 1650. 
And it was burned because it challenged the authority of the uh, Massachusetts uh, clergy. But other famous books of literature, such as Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass or Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, were also banned in various places. And book banning uh, persisted into the 20th century. In fact, we're kind of in a little bout of it right now. Um, other forms of culture also uh, fell under censorship. Um, different uh, positions on the political spectrum. The Birth of a Nation, for example, um, a 1915 film was banned in some states for racism and for its heroic presentation of the Ku Klux Klan. And several films have been banned since then. However, despite bans and restrictions in capitalist countries, there were no real authoritative central stances or positions on culture. So these were kind of scattered uh, in different, at different levels of society, the censorship. Uh, whereas under socialism, that was not the case. Um, in the West, I think elite literature moved into a very common critical or alternative position of social exposure and personal revelation. And it also inherited um, the European idea that too much happiness showed a superficial soul. Uh, and the result is that in elite literature, you won't find this kind of stock presentation of optimism as much as you do uh, in socialist literature. But really, it was in the areas of self-help and therapy and spiritualism and commerce that the optimistic vision was the most obvious, as the influence of Emile Coué and his optimistic auto-suggestion shows, and I, I think I did speak about that several years ago. But in popular culture, optimism also had a very powerful presence, and we'll look at one example. Um, that's Gidget, of course. An earlier one is perhaps the Horatio Alger Rags to Riches tale, which first appeared in his 1868 novel Ragged Dick. And this became a Gilded Age trope that showed the value of an optimistic and persistent frame of mind. So there's a lot more to go into there. Now in China, the situation was very different um, because the positive hero uh, existed in film and literature. This is, we're talking about socialist China. Um, and there's any number of examples. This is a Soviet model that was promoted by Russian writers such as Maxim Gorky and his uh, novel, Mother. And here on the left, you see a clip from Song of Youth, uh, the movie, the film. Um, and right there in the upper right is Gorky and his novel, Mother. So it's shown several times within um, this, um, this film, and it's mentioned several times in the novel. And on the right, of course, you see the emblem of revolutionary optimism, Lei Feng, uh, whom I've also uh, spoken with you about before. So my interest in Gidget and Song of Youth came from seeing literary models of optimism across the range of literature, popular, literary texts, uh, whatever. So I first want to do a kind of general comparison of these, and then I'll get into a little bit more detail. Now, Gidget and Song of Youth um, were published about the same time, 1957 for Gidget and 1958 for Song of Youth. And the authors um, are Frederick Koner and Yang Mo, and they lived approximately the same time. Uh, Frederick Koner uh, is about 10 years older than uh, Yang Mo, um, and they both lived, um, he lived until 1986 and she lived until 1995. So that 10 years uh, is consistent throughout their life. Uh, young Wu went through a very difficult transition from uh, being a young, well-to-do woman in a, in a rev, uh, into a revolutionary woman. So she made the kind of transition that we see in her novel uh, that happened to the main character. But it is far from a pure autobiography. It's kind of semi-autobiographical, and she um, enhanced it with a lot of things that actually never happened to her. Frederick Kohner also had something of a difficult life. He was an Austrian uh, Jewish screenwriter who worked in Germany, and he left in 1936 to escape the persecution of Jews. He had a brother in Hollywood, and so he was able to become a screenwriter, a kind of minor screenwriter in Hollywood. Now, ultimately, this is an uncanny comparison between a revolutionary journey and a different kind of journey of chasing waves and boys. 
But these books actually had a great deal in common. They're both fictionalized autobiography or biography. And in terms of the protagonists, they both feature young women who are moving into maturity. Both girls want to escape either difficult or somewhat stifling family life to different degrees. And the ocean plays a big role in both. Both are rescued from the ocean by young men. They look to males as their teachers and natural leaders, and they fall in love with young men through the stories. They both struggle to break into restricted groups, and they fight social conventions about how to be female. Uh, and finally, both novels were highly successful and became long-lasting cultural phenomena. They were closely followed by films dramatizing their story, and films, of course, get the story out much quicker than novels do. Um, so here you see the uh, initial films cover covers, or, or posters, rather. Now, Song of Youth became a red classic, um, so that means a communist classic, and there was a new drama based on the film that was produced in 2016. Gidget became a TV show. In, additional, in addition to many novel, many more novels were produced. Gidget does everything. And many films uh, came out as well. And finally, both novels extended their influence by being translated into over 10 languages each. So they really were quite uh, well known. Now, there's a lot of differences, of course, as well. They were set in different periods, although they were both written in the late 1950s. Gidget was set in the late 1950s, the time of writing, but Song of Youth was set in the 1930s. Yamor wrote for years. She revised constantly, whereas Koner completed his novel in six weeks. Uh, Yang's protagonist, Lin Dao Jing, lives with her father and her stepmother, who mistreat her. The, the, the stepmother mistreats her. Um, and Gidget lives with a loving, if somewhat conventional, family. One of the most important differences is the, the heft of the novel. So Song of Youth is 600 pages, and Gidget is only 120 pages. And of course, we have the overall topic, the serious subject matter of revolution versus fun. So we'll see whether or not we can uh, fruitfully compare these two novels. And I'll start with Song of Youth. <clears throat> so Song of Youth um, was the bulk of it, except for a short section at the beginning of Lin Dao Jing's life, uh, is set in 1930 to 1935, when the Japanese had invaded Manchuria and this, there was a student protest uh, in Beijing. It's a story of a young girl, Lin Dao Jing, whose biological parents are a wealthy man and a peasant woman whom he accosts and rapes. Her father steals her from her mother and her mother commits suicide as a result. She's mistreated by her stepmother, who tries to marry her off to a rich man. For the same reason, however, the stepmother has provided Dao Jing with a good education, not because she wants her to learn, but because educated girls had become more in demand as signs of their husband's modernity. Now, she escapes and she becomes a teacher. But wherever she goes, um, men keep trying to take advantage of her because of her beauty, um, and her initial suitor actually sends people out to try to catch her and bring her back uh, to her natal home. However, um, as she tries to throw herself in the ocean because she loses hope, she is rescued by a man named Yu Yongzi, who is a student at Beijing University who happens to be visiting home, which is the village where Dao Jing is teaching. She becomes a housewife in Beijing where he studies, but she is unhappy eventually and joins revolutionaries fighting Japanese and nationalists. She's unhappy also that he refuses to join this fight. So this story really is a long process of Lin Dao Jing becoming a true revolutionary. She is tortured in prison and finally accepted into the Chinese Communist Party. So, um, I want to give you some common interpretations, um, and I'll give interpretations for each novel, as well as provide a few points 
that provide evidence uh, for these interpretations before I explain uh, my ideas about the novels. So the first um, and most common uh, interpretation is exactly what I just told you, that this uh, Song of Youth really is a story about the transformation of a young woman from a bourgeois intellectual into a revolutionary. And this idea, of course, uh, this sort of transformation being highlighted in literature comes from the idea of the new Soviet man or the new socialist man, or let's just call uh, it the new socialist person since we have a gender, uh, somewhat of a gender focus here. So the idea is how do you become revolutionary through struggle? And the process means that you have to relinquish personal comfort, self-glory, and you have to learn how to see that the working and peasant life has its own integrity. Um, and you have to then sort of flip the, the tables and your uh, education no longer qualifies you to understand this. Um, but if, as long as you're willing to change, no one is excluded. And this, this struggle is really an inner as well as an outer struggle. Um, it is based on the idea that the world can change. So through this process, <clears throat> Lin Dao Jing becomes a long-suffering optimist with eternal hope for the future. In other words, she reaches the state of revolutionary optimism, or we could say revolutionary rapture, as seen in this moment from the film when Lin is accepted into the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the film was originally black and white, but it was um, color was added to it in some cases a little extremely, I think. Um, so if we accept this interpretation, and it does have, of course, a lot of explanatory power, then really this is the story of Lin Daojing as a model of struggle for an educated person who may have not been brought up worrying about class or poverty. So that's one interpretation. Now, the second interpretation is a little more complicated, and it has to do with how under socialism, politics becomes intertwined with sexuality. Uh, this story is known throughout the 20th century as love versus revolution. Um, according to this way of thinking, the job of the state is to revolutionize biological desire through sublimation. So all of your desire for um, another person is supposed to be transferred into revolutionary efforts. However, there's often a tension in the novel um, and in the film between sexual desire and revolutionary desire. This is much clearer in the film because the camera kind of um, uh, uh, focuses on Lynn's face and her beauty um, and her showing her inner kind of struggle and desire very well, but it exists in the novel as well. Now, this is the, really the story of revolutionary self-discovery. So it's a kind of Bildungsroman, uh, a kind of revolutionary Bildungsroman. And it asks which kind of desire you will invest with, uh, in in your life. Uh, this, if you want to think of the novel from this perspective, it's really about the three men that Lin Daojing is involved with. Yu Yongzi, Lu Jiachuan, and Jiang Hua, and about the process of sublimation or keeping order between different kinds of desire, making sure that you desire the politically correct person. Now, as I mentioned before, Yu Yongzi, her husband, uh, whom she meets before she goes to Beijing, is in uh, a study of traditional Chinese poetry, and he tells her that she needs to accept the world as it is. Um, she leaves him eventually and becomes involved with Liu Jiachuan, an inspiring revolutionary leader who is tortured and killed by the nationalists. And finally, after his death, she gets involved with Jiang Hua, who is also a revolutionary leader, but he's not quite as sparkling and interesting as Liu. However, he is on the right side, so to speak. So that's really um, that kind of idea uh, about who you were involved with. So it's really an idea that is focused on the educated person and their devotion to another person as opposed to their devotion to the, uh, the cause of the revolution. 
The third really is, is yet more complicated, and it has to do with uh, aesthetics and beauty. Um, and this argument goes that aesthetics and beauty is a crucial problem in the revolutionary transformation of well-educated people. Now, the socialist theory is that aesthetics unformed by, uninformed, I'm sorry, by revolutionary knowledge must be rejected and replaced by something called revolutionary aesthetics. Now, this is also an intellectual journey because workers and peasants already know this principle, which they have learned from their lives. But it has to be relearned by educated people. And what they must really relearn is that pure beauty is, does not exist outside of a context of meaning or an ideological context. So we have an example um, in the novel, and some of it appears um, also in the film. So here we see the kind of non-revolutionary approach to beauty, in this case, the ocean. Um, where the two budding lovers are walking by the sea and Yu Yongzi begins to recite classical Chinese poetry to Lin Daojing. And here's a somewhat more heavy-handed but yet more relief revealing scene where the tools of labor for fishermen become a screen through which the romantic relationship develops. Now, in another scene in the novel, which I couldn't find in the film, but I'm absolutely confident it's there somewhere, although I may have made some kind of an unconscious transfer, Lynn comments on the ocean and, and says, oh, how beautiful it is. And she is corrected by a peasant who says, what's the point if you can't earn a living from it? So he sees this only as a livelihood where she sees it as something um, separated from livelihood and very beautiful. And that's the crux really of the aesthetic problem for well-educated people. They're trained to see things as beautiful, but not to look at them um, as uh, sources of livelihood or uh, resources for people who are uh, in, the, in the lower classes. Now, um, this then really is the story of Yu Yongzi and the traditional literary and isolated aesthetic concern versus contextualized knowledge of the revolutionary students. And it has to be learned by everyone who does not uh, live it. Now, the fourth idea here is gender roles. And I think, you know, most of you probably are very interested in the gender roles. So, um, the heroine, Lin Daojing, in addition to becoming a revolutionary and a communist, undergoes many gender changes that actually turn out to be just as revolutionary. So the first thing she does is to leave home alone in order to escape a, an arranged marriage uh, to an older man and the becoming of a concubine. So she's going to be uh, sent off really to become a concubine. Um, so what she gets through this is her independence. So she fights for her independence. And second, she struggles against the confining and cloistering impulses of her husband, Yu Yongzi, who tries to keep her at home um, occupied with domestic tasks. And here we see in a very warm domestic environment, and this is when um, Dao Jing is still really committed to this, he thanks her for sacrificing her interests so that he can pursue his. And the third thing is that she rejects female, traditional female ornamentation, fancy clothes, makeup, jewelry. And this is a dichotomy that is shown clearly in many comparisons, and we also find it in Gidget. Um, it's shown most clearly in one of her uh, friends, uh, Bai Li Ping, who is a university student who becomes a movie star. And here we see her with her feather fan, heavily ornamented, and she's pulling Dao Jing into a car as she lectures her about not becoming involved in the fight against the Japanese. So she pulls her into the car and they end up at a party which is full of Japanese and uh, uh, Japanese people and nationalists. So this is here in the red, that's um, um, her friend, uh, Bai Li Ping. And you see here, there's a woman dressed in traditional uh, Japanese dress whom she is greeting. And then down here, we see um, Dao Jing, very uncomfortable in her outfit made of rough cloth. 
And so she's pulled into this very uh, difficult environment and eventually she sneaks away. The fourth thing is that she engages in study. In the 1930s, this is a path only recently open to women and girls. Now the gender related issues actually come from May 4th culture, uh, which is uh, the May 4th incident in 1919 is when students protested the Chinese government's weak response to the Treaty of Versailles, which allowed Japan to retain some Chinese territories. This turned into a broad political and cultural struggle uh, that went on for decades. However, in Marxism, the struggle for gender equality was never supposed to rival the socialist focus on class struggle. In the novel, however, it really takes on a very an important role. And this shows the mixture in the author's view of pure socialist or revolutionary concerns and of what is became um, called May 4th issues, which are independence, gender equality in labor, social roles, the national role of women, and self-confidence of women. And these are really, in the novel, as important as the revolutionary issues. So the novel has been criticized uh, for that. So before I move on to Gidget, I want to sum up um, the different foci of these four interpretations. So the first is the, the just reviewing the version of the change from uh, bourgeois intellectual to revolutionary. The second is the relationship between politics and sexuality. And the third is the issue of revolutionary aesthetics um, versus isolated beauty ideas of beauty, and the fourth is gender roles. So these, these things actually helped me come to my own ideas. Um, uh, I think all of these interpretations have some, uh, have some good aspects to them that can help us understand the novel and also help us un understand Chinese society in the 1950s. Um, but I can separate my interpretation into two parts. So first, it has to do with aesthetics, but a different way, in a different way from that which I just described. I, I believe that aesthetics are at the radical kernel of the novel. There is a very troublesome tendency in the novel, which we tend to overlook or dismiss, and it has to do with the way that the world becomes altered in a fixed way. It's, a, it's really a very simple idea, basically. Everything revolutionary is beautiful and everything anti-revolutionary is ugly. Now this aesthetic judgment exists from the beginning. In other words, the novel actually unfolds on these principles and with these two poles always in view, the beautiful and the ugly. So some of the words that are used to describe uh, reactionaries in the novel are those the nationalists um, and the Japanese and anyone who does not um, support the revolutionary attempt to get rid of the Japanese uh, is are words like a fat, short, mulish faced, monkey faced, pallid, monkey like, pasty faced, spiteful, pompous, shallow, smug and pockmarked. These people have bulging, protruding, small, beady, wolfish, or wanton eyes that are bloodshot from dissipation, savage laughs, and sullen, villainous faces with sneering lips and sinister, insolent smiles. Their eyebrows can be bushy and meet over the nose, apparently an ugly characteristic. I didn't know this. Now, the revolutionaries, by contrast, are handsome and pretty, tall for men with strong fists and warm hearts, they're good and sweet, trim and alert, cheerful, hardworking, optimistic, serious, honest, and firm. Their warm and steadfast eyes sparkle with fearless intelligence and excitement. Their cheeks are rosy and they are full of health, vitality, and youth, even when they are old. Whereas the revolutionaries are brave and unrelenting under torture, the reactionaries squeal like pigs when attacked. Someone thought of as beautiful, however, can become ugly once that person's politics is deciphered. And we have an, uh, an example in the novel with uh, Lin Dao Jing's brother, half brother, who um, she originally believes is quite handsome, but as she uh, starts to understand his politics, she sees how ugly he is. There is absolute consistency in the novel. 
Um, but the, there's more emphasis on the anti-revolutionaries' ugliness than on the revolutionaries' beauty. So there's a connection between what is in the heart and what is showing on the outside. And this uh, sort of makes perfect sense within the context of the novel. So we can read an example of this from the novel. You can read in Chinese or English as you like. Uh, Dao Jing turned slowly, chin up, to look straight as the man's thin, contorted lips. His pallid, lantern jaw face, the wolfish gleam in his eyes, and his dry, brackish lips reminded her of the strange way of her cruel persecutor, Hu Meng An. This is someone who was pursuing her. Just as all communists seem to share certain fine qualities, all secret service men and fascists had the same repulsive characteristic. Now, the second part of my focus is the, comes from considering this as a kind of maneuver in the novel. But I find that the novel actually almost challenges this maneuver, um, even though the main character, Lin Dao Jing, does not get it. But the writer seems to get it and puts the challenge in the voice of other characters. So here's another example of uh, Lin Dao Jing's friend, uh, Xiao Yan. It's kind of long, but let's read it anyway. On their way back, Dao Jing pointed to a young man hurrying past under the street lamps and whispered to her friend, Look, Xiao Yan, do you think he's a communist? Xiao Yan cast a glance at the young man and laughed softly. I think you're bewitched. What grounds do you have for saying he's a communist? You can tell he's honest, firm, and serious. I believe communists may differ in appearance and temperament, but they have many common characteristics. The young man who just passed looked more serious than ordinary people. Xiao Yan broke into merry peals of laughter. Since when have you become a physiognomist? It's true. So it appears that um, this appears to contain the recognition that the tendency to aesthetically transform the world through, uh, through what you think it should be can be part of the construction of a powerful illusion. Now, on this point, uh, the work of Sergei Prozorov can, has helped me think through things, even though he didn't write about China, but rather about the USSR under Stalin. Um, we should remember that uh, Song of Youth was imagined, written, and published during the time when Stalin was revered in China. And harking back to my uh, talk earlier, uh, this relationship is codified in a stamp from 1950 where we see Mao shaking Stalin's hand. Now what Prozorov argues, one of the things he argues is that the key feature of Stalinism is the attempt to produce life or to produce life as it should be. Now this is to some degree shared across socialist cultures. And how does it happen in Song of Youth? Well, Lin Dao Jing is primed to learn through her difficult experience at home and in life, but she first learns socialist ideas through books, not from life, after she arrives in Beijing. And here is her description. These books also told her what had caused her mother's death, banishing the pessimism and despair that had so often assailed her. They filled her heart with an irresistible revolutionary ardor that impelled her ever onward. So the books provide a way for her to understand her life and they chart a path forward for her. According to Prozorov's study of Stalinism, the theory is that after socialism is learned, it must be lived. But Lin Dao Jing has really only learned it and not lived it. She has learned from peasants, from, from books, from peasants and from male mentors. What she has learned, however, is life as it should be. So we could say, so life as it should be, we could say this, if we were to sum this up, the process of becoming a revolutionary reveals the beauty of the world, which naturally drains away from those who refuse to engage and brilliantly infuses those who, who work to remold themselves. So therein we find the source of the ugly versus beautiful issue that is so much a part of the novel. And here again, we see Lin as she's accepted into the Chinese Communist Party and uh, an example of her beauty and her revolutionary rapture. Um, and I think also harking back to one of my earlier topics, step by step, we also can see how the craven and ugly Akyu 
from the 1920s in a story by Lu Xun becomes the enthusiastic and beautiful Lei Feng, who is, um, uh, he's a, he was a real person, but through his diaries, he, uh, he was made into a model uh, of a communist worker. So beautification is really a crucial component in the process of making revolutionaries permanently optimistic. Now I'm going to go on to Gidget. This is not fictionalized autobiography, but fictionalized biography based on Kathy Koner's summer of 1957 in Southern California, as told by Kathy Koner to her father. And this is a picture of Kathy and her father uh, looking at the book Gidget. So let's uh, examine the plot briefly. So Gidget is a nickname, uh, the two words going together, girl plus midget. And she is age 15 throughout. She is very short. So um, she's called a uh, Gidget, midget and girl. Her real name is Franzi in the novel. And she sees a group of boys surfing at the beach. But she goes out to swim and one rescues her from a rope current, just as Lin Dao Jing was rescued from throwing herself in the ocean. This guy is, uh, his surfing name is Moondoggy and he becomes her love interest. So all of these boys are somewhat older than Gidget. Gidget decides to break into the group which does not allow females and to learn how to surf. Now, like Lin Dao Jing, she achieves her goals, acceptance into the group, learning to surf and getting Moondoggy as a boyfriend. A little bit different than the revolutionary goals. So let's look at a few interpretations. I'll do the same thing here. The first one is that Gidget is a clean teen pick. And this talks about really um, the film that was made out of Gidget rather than the novel. But I think that um, these points really apply to both. So the novel shows teens not as rebellious or nasty or juvenile delinquents, but as wholesome and fun loving. As such, the story often has been dismissed as teenage fluff and also as part of the beach culture of the late 1950s and early 1960s. And here's some posters for uh, beach movies from the time. And you see here, this is um, Annette Funicello, who later on became a musketeer. It, not later, actually, that, that movie is older than this picture. But she became a musketeer, and this certainly um, is related to Walt Disney and who shows the way for people, for young people to grow up. Have a safe fling when you are young, but do not cause familial and social problems. So that's what the beach culture was all about. Um, it also counters a concern with juvenile delinquents um, in the 1950s and alienated youth. And you see it with here in Rebel Without a Cause, down here it, it says, and they both came from good families. So there's real concern that something is going on with youth, um, even youth that come from good families. Now in the 1940s, um, J. Edgar, in the, mid of the middle 1940s, J. Edgar Hoover, who was head of the FBI, identified what he called a threat to America that was bigger than communism, juvenile delinquency. And as you see in these pictures, um, for girls and women, being bad is worse than it is for boys. So they're often victimized. Now in this, th these are um, both films and, and also uh, novels. This is a novel and this is a film. In this interpretation, the story is about Gidget and the boy she's involved with. And they are the focus then, rather than just Gidget herself, it's, it's about her relationship with these boys. Second, the novel exemplifies the status quo uh, of, of sexual relations according to this interpretation. In other words, some say Gidget is an unfeminist story that supports the idea that women are inferior. Um, according to these interpreters, um, one of the points of the novel is that the masculinity of surfing cannot be contaminated by women. Um, also, uh, because it shows Gidget only wanting what the boys already have, the, the novel glorifies sexism, according to this perspective. And Gidget succeeds breaking in only because she's young and, fall, and small, thus becoming nothing more than a mascot for the boys. 
And here's an image um, from the film, and you see that she does have a kind of mascot-like um, presence sitting on the shoulders of these young muscular men. Now, the third idea is that the third interpretation is almost opposite from that one. That is that Gidget, the novel, opened doors for women and girls. Now, the novel may have been limited by gender notions of the era, but it had good results, these critics argue, by opening doors to experience that were not experiences that were not really available to girls before. It increased the numbers of female participation in surfing. And this actually has been well documented through interviews with surfers who started um, surfing after they, after they saw the movie or read the novel. Now, women and men had surfed together uh, long before the modern period. Here is an 1835 drawing by James Edward Alexander, who documented the practice of women and men surfing together naked in West Africa. This practice was brought to a halt by Western missionaries who did not think it was proper. However, um, I, these critics argue that uh, Gidget opened the door for surfers like Kiala Kennedy, Kennelly, who became pro at 17 in 1995. And here you can compare the size of the wave that Kathy Conner is surfing down there in the lower right with Kennelly's, um, just to see that we are really are talking, this actually is Kathy Conner surfing. We really are talking uh, about something very different. Um, female surfers are, of course, fighting for equality. So opening the doors to more women is a positive kind of feminist approach to interpreting the novel. And the fi finally, um, in the third interpretation, uh, we want to say that uh, Gidget is perhaps a feminist. Um, so uh, this novel is the most positive uh, kind of feminist interpretation of what's going on in Gidget. Now, the fourth one is that Gidget is the Catcher in the Rye for girls. Now, the Catcher in the Rye was J.D. Salinger's novel, was published in serial form in the mid-1940s before it came out as a novel in 1951. I read it in high school. I remember it very well. It influenced me. Um, it is so-called serious literature. I read it in literature class. And this may seem to be a strange connection because these two books, Gidget and Song of uh, Catcher in the Rye, um, may be, uh, it may more obviously seem that they're on the opposite side of the teenage uh, spectrum. One is about youth alienation and angst via the main character Holden Caulfield versus youthful fun and pleasure via the main character Gidget. But no one less than Francis Ford Coppola, who was the director of undoubtedly serious films such as The Godfather in 1972 and Apocalypse Now in 1979, compared Gidget to Catcher in the Rye. And he directed a high school stage production of Gidget in 2000. So uh, I don't, I think this actually is kind of an uncanny and a bit um, of a brilliant uh, connection to make, and it probably deserves a lot more attention than I can give to it. So if we sum up the four interpretations of Gidget, um, clean teen pick that fights against uh, juvenile delinquency, enhances the gender quo, and in other words, it's really an unfeminist novel, Open Doors for Women, and it's a, actually a feminist novel, and Gidget is the catcher in the rye for girls, which seems to put it into a kind of existential, uh, deep philosophy category. So those are the four interpretations, and now I'm going to move on to uh, my idea. So what I argue is that Gidget contains a radical kernel, despite the seeming superficiality of the story, and maybe in tandem with Gidget's primary breakthrough comes in a rejection of the superficial and an embrace of the real. The story, therefore, uh, from my perspective, is about authenticity or the, the struggle for the experience of the real. Um, this is very thoroughly addressed in the novel, I believe, and it's a theme that we also see somewhat in Song of Youth. Now, there's several instances of this in Gidget. Um, realness, um, one of the kinds of realness has to do with being part, being an authentic part of one's own environment or of space and place. 
So she is an authentic American, but her parents are European. Now, don't forget this is being written by um, <clears throat> Koner, who himself is a European. So this is how he is, sees this problem. Now, the author, Koner, peppers the narrative with references to European culture. Um, he finds it a very significant thing. So let's look at this example, um, which is part um, of the novel. Listen, darling, my darling mother said. And, and, you know, this style where he has two darlings, this kind of coy style goes throughout the novel. Are you by any chance chasing this boy? Whatever gives you this idea. I don't have to read tea leaves, Franzi, but you're making a horrible mistake. A boy's got to chase you. It's as old as the mountains. You talk about your European mountains, I said. The ones here are different. So that's a kind of realness of place and, and of understanding um, the deep culture of a place. The second is a realness in appearance. Um, and this uh, you know, also connects up to uh, topics in Song of Youth. And it's very important because, of course, Hollywood is powerful and they're in Southern California. Now, Gidget refuses to wear falsies and bleach her hair blonder. She rejects superficial high school experiences in which appearance is the most important thing. Um, so a real experience in the world versus learning is another aspect of uh, Gidget's, the novel's focus on authenticity. So as opposed to Lin Daojin, Gidget does not travel through book learning, but rejects birth book learning and insists on living, on learning from life. And this is something, of course, that Lin Daojing wants to do and that she's striving to do. So here's a quote. I sort of feel that living life is better than reading about it in books. This is in Gidget, in the voice of Gidget written by uh, Koner, the real Gidget's father. Um, another kind of realness comes in the experience of nature. No swimming pools, no lakes, only the ocean, only the Pacific Ocean. So here's the quote. Pools are not the real thing, of course, but give me a mountain lake. Boy, they're doing it for me. But the real thing is the ocean. And I don't mean that crummy Adriatic Ocean. And I don't mean the Atlantic either. I tried them all out. I mean the Pacific. There's no water around the world that can beat it. Now, the most important thing, so you have the, these different kinds of realness that are emphasized and authenticity, they're emphasized through the novel, but most important is the realness in the physical ecstasy of surfing. And here's a phrase that, here is a quote rather from the novel um, that literary scholars absolutely love to find. So let me read it. The old heat just pounded down on us. My skin started blistering, but we went out again and again because you can't just loll around and shoot the breeze and lie to the sun when a set of waves is going like it did that afternoon. Well, this lie to the sun is kind of non-idiomatic English. It should be lie in the sun, but this almost seems to suggest that you cannot tell a lie to the sun. So you, you're forced by the power of this natural phenomenon to go out and, and um, surf the waves or be in the ocean. So these are, this is uh, one kind of authenticity, um, the authenticity of nature and of having some kind of an actual true relationship uh, with natural forces. And finally, um, the fourth one is, has to do with gender. So Gidget realizes that men have access to authenticity much more than do women. And she fights to be one of the boys. She regards herself as different from be uh, bleach blonde women on the beach. That's hard to say, bleach blonde women on the beach. Here's how she describes them. They were all racing toward the hut, grabbing wildly for jeans and shirts and beach bags. The visiting koozies got the screaming memes. They yelled their cute little peroxided heads off. The entire female experience is suspicious to Gidget. The great kahuna, this is one of the surfers, one of the older surfers in his 20s, uh, did some more beard scratching. Then he said, tell you something, kid. We don't like dames around here. Not while the sun's out. They're always stirring up trouble. Surfing is serious business, not for dames. I'm not dames, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Now, this phrase, I'm not dames, she's trying to separate herself from 
uh, what she calls the bleach blonde koozies. Um, the, the women who um, are doing different things than the men. She looks at what the men have as the authentic experience. So Gidget, I think like Song of Youth, contains a recognition that this building up of the real is at least partially an illusion. And this is the little maneuver that the novel makes. First of all, there's a glitch in the writing. It often appears as if someone much older than 15 is telling the story. And indeed, that's true. Um, this older voice organizes the timeline and provides a perspective that a 15-year-old probably would not have. Um, and Gidget, most crucially, finds she, uh, she, she has a kind of epiphany when she realizes that she isn't really part of this group uh, when she returns after an illness and no one asks her where she went. The thing that really got me was that no one, no, not not one single one asked me where I'd been. For a moment, I became choked and aching with disappointment. Then I suddenly realized that I was no member of the crew, simply a blind passenger. If I had never come back, no one would ever have noticed. And finally, Gidget keeps asking the surfers questions about where they get the money to eat and how they can surf when they get older. In other words, she has a constant awareness that life demands work. So, um, this to me is similar to what we see in Song of Youth where not the main character, but some of the other characters question this idea that um, the inner revolutionary nature will produce outward beauty. And here I think what we have is um, the idea that uh, this is temporary and it is not real even though it involves searching for a certain kind of authentic reality. That is, being a surf bum isn't really a real life. So in conclusion, I guess um, I can say that both characters uh, reach an optimistic state and the specific content differs depending on the political and cultural environment. But there are many themes that repeat themselves in both novels, despite the differences. And what fascinates me the most is how there's a small voice that keeps questioning the narrative by showing what the illusion is based on. For Song of Youth, the aesthetic illusion of beauty in the ideological pure, and for Gidget, the awareness that the small world in which she is seeking an experience of the real is temporary and enclosed. Uh, in both cases, however, this small voice cannot overpower the illusion of the fully committed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Larson. That was great. Um, a lot of things to think about <laughs> and to digest. Um, we are going into our Q&A session. So just as a reminder for our audience, uh, our Q&A is... Um, our Q&A, in order to ask a question, you click on the little Q&A box, and that is um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, typically. Sometimes it's at the top for some of uh, the tablet uh, users and possibly your phone user. You just might have to click, uh, um, touch the screen and um, the menu will show up. So the first question, as we come in, okay. Can you speak a little bit more about how you chose these two novels to compare? Actually, it was kind of a difficult process. I've always wanted to write about Song of Youth. I had never considered writing anything about Gidget. And of course, I'm not a specialist on uh, American culture or literature. But as I was uh, searching for some kind of literary text to compare, you know, because my, my overall theme of optimism is always there. And I knew Song of Youth was a great example, um, both because it's, uh, uh, it shows this issue so clearly, but also because it's so famous in China and everyone knows it even now. Um, I couldn't find anything that was perfect uh, in, in American literature. And so it was a process of going through this realization that um, elite literature really didn't follow this optimistic um, model in the West, um, that the, it, it was really thought to be uh, somewhat superficial to show this all kind of optimism and happiness, and uh, that I had to look into popular culture uh, to find something that would work. Uh, and this is something like, this is, of course, part of one of the chapters um, of my book. And uh, 
I explained it a, a little bit more thoroughly there. Um, but when, once I thought of that, I immediately thought of uh, late 1950s uh, novels and Gidget came to mind because I knew uh, it had been extremely influential. Um, I grew up with it uh, uh, and I knew who, who Gidget was. Um, I think Gidget now, nowadays, a lot of people don't know who Gidget was, but for a very long time, um, she was part of the conversation. I could have chosen uh, some other novels as well. Um, but um, the comparison, like when I found the Coppola comparison and the fact that he had compared uh, Gidget to Catcher in the Rye, that really uh, struck a chord for me uh, because Catcher in the Rye was also a very influential uh, kind of different model um, of, of unoptimistic uh, uh, youth. And so then I, I, I realized that these two novels would really work well together, Gidget and Song of Youth. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, let's see. We've got another question. Uh, this comes from Catherine. Oh, yes. Um, so we know that you also gave this a similar talk to a Chinese audience. And so we're wondering what their comments were about the comparison of these two works. Well, the audiences that I speak to often um, no Gidget or no Song of Youth. And of course, this audience in China that I spoke to, this was a group of university uh, English students uh, and literature students. Um, and I gave the topic, I gave the talk in English uh, as they asked me to do, but I knew they wouldn't know about Gidget. So I actually in included more historical information uh, than I did for this talk about Gidget. And I knew they would know all about Song of Youth. So I shrunk that part down a little bit. Um, and sure enough, none of them had ever heard of Gidget, uh, and none of them have, had ever read it, and so they didn't really know what to say about it. Um, I think the one of the comments I got was, had to do with theoretical approaches to understanding novels, and asked me why I jumped around so much between uh, feminist approaches, uh, non, you know, other kinds of uh, aesthetic issues, etc., um, and so I think uh, the question was that I had my uh, my approach uh, of understanding optimism in these novels was confusing. Um, and in fact, I have given a talk about my optimism project um, in China, several talks. And the first time I gave it, um, I met with utter, utter uh, lack of understanding. And uh, people said to me, optimism is a state of mind. What are you talking about? <laughs> And so um, I realized that I didn't get the message across very well. And in the second talk, I, I prefaced everything with um, really my understanding that optimism can not only be a state of mind, but can also be um, something that is promoted by either an organization, such as a school or a church, or uh, the state itself in certain kinds of uh, theories, such as the positive hero in literature. So that then it, it went much better. So I have to talk about that a little bit because optimism uh, usually refers to a kind of psychological state. And um, I had uh, a lot of difficulty explaining that it's, it's much more than that from my perspective, from the perspective that I'm using right now to study it. That's great, thank you. We've got a question from the, the audience. Uh, Jeffrey says, that was a really stimulating talk, Wendy. So many contradictions and similarities within the texts and the movies and between the two. I never would have thought of. Do you see any contradiction between the essentialization of beauty, parentheses, the movie star, female and even male, um, is attractive according to the male gaze, even if they askew makeup, on the one hand, and revolutionary themes on the other hand, that to be a revolutionary, one must be forged as a, a revolutionary through practice, experience, uh, even hardship if you were born bourgeois or at least educated. Okay, I, I don't see, first of all, much attention to the male gaze, even though I know what you're talking about. I think in the film, certainly the camera can give us the male gaze. Um, because of its foci. There is a constant tension throughout. There's constant tension. Um, does it actually rise to the surface as a theme? 
um, this attention to beauty and the uh, process of becoming a revolutionary? Um, I don't think so. It doesn't, it doesn't arise as a contrast and a theme, but because of exactly what I was talking about, the, the process of um, turning the world into a beautiful thing as long as you have a revolutionary perspective. So that almost disallows a um, the kind of thing that we see in Gidget, where Gidget becomes aware that a focus on beauty or a focus on appearance will actually hurt her as she strives for an authentic experience. Um, and so I, I, I think the answer is no, that it does not, uh, even though there's a tension in there, it does not rise to the level of uh, being considered. Except of course, in those comments of, um, uh, Dao Jing's friend when she laughs at her. Um, so somebody knows, but it, does, it doesn't uh, appear really as a theme in the novel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's definitely a, uh, a question, a, a deep question to think about. <laughs> Great answer, thank you. Um, kind of going along the theme of that authenticity that you were mentioning, um, you talk about how that is more of an, uh, it's an external seeking of that authenticity. Um, but could you speak more on um, the authenticity, excuse me, the authenticity um, within each of the protagonists and how they, how that either the search and as well as the internal authenticity differs in both works? Hmm, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Are we talking about Gidget now, or are we talking about Song of Youth? Uh, either or both. <laughs> there are both. Okay, so um, I think you know the idea of authenticity or realness. You know that you want to experience something real is is a, a question in both of the novels. Um, in the in Song of Youth, uh, the, your only access to reality is through this revolutionary uh, transformation. So if you refuse to go through that, you never will access something really authentic. Um, and it's through this process that you come to understand the world very differently, um, not as something uh, for, to be crude for you to frolic in, but as something that um, exists in its materiality and also in its, uh, in its kind of uh, existence as a labor resource. Uh, so you start to see the world very differently and the relationships in the world very differently. Um, I think that this, in Song of Youth, that is this approach, or, or rather the focus on auth an authentic revolutionary experience is somewhat contaminated by this aesthetic side uh, that turns everything revolutionary into beauty. Um, now in Gidget, um, there's another side that I didn't have time to talk to you about, which is the authenticity of the boys and their, um, their relationship to the sea. So there's a lot of uh, instances there where Gidget actually, she performs the traditional female function of bringing food for them because they don't have any money, basically. Uh, even though um, Moondoggy has come from a very wealthy family and his uh, parents have kind of disowned him because he he has is living they haven't really disowned him but they've distanced themselves from him because he's living the surf bum life instead of going about getting an education and getting a job um, however his father offers to give him a car and he refuses because he believes he must be true to his vision of what he's doing. Um, and so you, you find that kind of thing. The great kahuna lives in a shack on the ocean. I don't think you can do that anymore, but at this time you probably could, um, that he built. Um, and he is worried about both about Gidget's uh, purity as a young girl, and but also about the way that she succeeds in, in infiltrating and somewhat contaminating their group. So he tries to stop it but eventually uh, he allows her in. 
Um, so there is a, a attention to that authenticity as well. There is no attention to the parents' life and their Gidget's parents and their their sense of what is authentic. However, because in the background there's always some um, Gidget questioning, um, and this is a difference. Gidget questions. Uh, Lin Daojing does not question, um, but Gidget questions whether or not this can. Uh, be sustained, and she knows there's something else out there, but she's she's uh, kind of viscerally aware of the female fakeness that she's been brought up with, you know, is that making yourself look good uh, in various ways and participating in a kind of um, frivolity, which she believes she is not doing. She believes that she's doing something much more serious. Thank you. That's fascinating. Thank you so much. The next question is, let's see, we've got uh, another question from Jeff. I love it. Did Gidget the novel ever get criticized from what we might consider a political viewpoint? Were there political revisions of Song of Youth during its publication history? Um, okay, so did Gidget ever get criticized? Yes, it's been criticized wildly. Um, I don't know when the earliest criticism was of the novel. Um, but uh, certainly today there's uh, reams of, of critics, <laughs> reams of criticism material uh, that are aimed at the different aspects of Gidget. Um, but there's also this more nuanced approach to Gidget, you know, looking at um, the kind of social influence it had. And uh, because surfers like um, Keala Kennelly uh, directly attribute uh, their success to this novel, and the way that the novel showed a girl in the water surfing, even though she wasn't doing very much when you compare it with that 1835 uh, image of these girls um, surfing with, um, with boys, um, all of them out there. Uh, she didn't really attack any big waves, but nonetheless, it, they, do, they do claim that this novel influenced them. Um, so Song of Youth, has it ever been uh, rewritten, not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, I don't think it has been rewritten from the original. I have not seen the, uh, the 2016 production, um, so I don't know to what extent that revises the narrative, but I don't think the novel ever underwent a kind of censorship or rewriting, although it also was criticized mostly for this focus on gender. Um, okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, you mentioned uh, when we were talking about how you chose those books that uh, you wanted to do Song of Youth. Were there, and you've also mentioned some of those controversial like books that were banned, <laughs> controversial in quotes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Were, was Song of Youth, uh, like, were there other books, other literatures or movies that were had similar themes, or was that a standout for you, and, and is that why you chose them? There were many other novels that have similar themes, um, but this one, because of this um, focus on youth, which I'm also looking at another writer uh, named Wang Wang, Wang, Wang who uh, wrote a, a, a novel about youth uh, in the early 1950s. And um, the kind of um, way that his novel is very different in that it, it does not show this very typical, almost by this time, codified transformation of uh, an educated young person into a fervent revolutionary. Now, uh, Yang Mo was able to get that across because she set her novel back in the 1930s when all these political anti-Japanese and anti-nationalist movements uh, were going on. Um, and it's, it's always been a kind of uh, trope in Chinese film and um, fiction after 1949 is that you, if you set your novel uh, or your film during the time of the, of the revolutionary struggle against the Japanese uh, or against the nationalists who are blamed for not fighting the Japanese, you're relatively safe. So there's a lot of novels and films that do that up to the present time. It's much harder to talk about contemporary society, um, and that's a dangerous thing to do. Um, but there, um, Wang Meng's novel was 
um, actually, it, it became very famous among young people um, around in the early 1980s. But some of his work before that was heavily criticized. Um, and he has a story uh, for in the late 1950s um, that shows kind of how disillusionment creeps in uh, when one realizes um, that there is this building of an illusion that doesn't necessarily correspond with reality. And for that, that was censored and he was sent, he wasn't really sent out, but he, he was um, ejected from the Chinese Writers Association. He was very young at the time. Um, and he went uh, to Xinjiang and lived for 20 years and learned Uyghur. Um, and still has connections there. He later became Minister of Culture. So there, there are, there's a very rocky history of censorship. And um, as I think Jeff is implying, even rewriting of novels um, and rewriting or recasting uh, of movies to eliminate certain scenes. But I don't think it happened with Song of Youth. The Song of Youth was always, even though it was criticized for too much focus on gender rather than on the transformation, that was thought to be uh, a kind of leftover from May 4th culture. It's something that came in and it was normal at the time because people like Yang Mo would have had that kind of perspective. So it was criticized, but still bracketed as a very good and powerful uh, story of how uh, an educated person transforms herself into a revolutionary. Thank you so much. Uh, our next question comes from Sabina. Uh, she asks, where can I buy a copy of Song of Youth in English? Or no, I don't know if you can buy a copy or not. <laughs> um, you can get it at the library, though. There should be one. There's this translation. The translations that I used in my talk are by a translator named Nanying, and this was translated quite early. Um, I don't know if there's been another translation or not. not I don't know about it if there is one. But um, you can get that translation in the library because it was, I think, published by uh, Foreign Languages Press, China Foreign Languages Press. You might be able to pick up a copy in a, a used bookstore or something like Maybe you can get it on Amazon. I'm not sure. <laughs> I got mine at the library. Thank you. We will be sure to uh, look at all of those <laughs> sources and see what we can find. All right. It looks like we're at the end of our questions for now. Uh, so I think um, we can definitely wrap that up. We will be having the tea house later and uh, Dr. Larson is joining us. So if you guys have any follow up questions you think of, you can join us there. I do want to just um, Professor Larson, is there anything else that you would like to say and share with us? Um, no, I think I pretty much shared all of it. I hope that next time I see you, this optimism project will be completed so I can stop talking about it. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Oh, we love hearing about it. That's great. <laughs> um, the audience agrees with me. Uh, Jeff wrote, amazing comparison. Uh, Dennis said, thank you for an, another engaging and thoughtful presentation. And Sabina says, thank you, Dr. Larson. I thoroughly enjoyed your thought-provoking and interesting presentation. So uh, I think everyone agrees <laughs> that we love um, hearing what you're doing and talking about and thinking about. And I'm so glad that you're willing to share with us. Thank so, you. Yeah. So really quickly, um, just want to put up uh, information for our next presentation. That is going to be titled Following the Thread, China Along the Silk Road with uh, Professor Gasparini. Uh, we will be doing that online. And so um, uh, you will get our information. You can go to our website at uh, www.firstsaturdaypdx.org. And we'll also, of course, send out our announcements with those links to register for the December talk. Okay, we're moving on to our tea house in a few minutes. So just a reminder, if you are able to join us, we would love that. Um, and we have our tea house. It's going to be at 11. So a few minutes to take what's called a bio break, <laughs> grab some snacks or tea, of course, to join us in the tea house. And we'll just uh, spend some time uh, chatting and maybe talking more about these books, maybe just uh, chatting about 
you know, all the other things in our life. Up on the screen, there's a reminder of where to find our Tea House link. So you'll, we'll leave the webinar that we're in right now. And then in your confirmation email, you'll scroll down to that second link and it'll say the Tea House link. Um, and that is a, in a Zoom meeting format. So we'll get to see each other. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you guys so much for joining us. I hope you all are safe and, um, you know, staying um, warm <laughs> and with your electrical in all this uh, stormy weather we have this weekend. And take care and we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Bye.